Right, shall we start? Yeah, good afternoon. I'm pleased that so many showed up. <laughs> the rest is probably on holiday already. Yeah, that's not in fairness, that's exactly their excuse. But they're bad luck because all of that could be very relevant for the exam, of course, as every time. But I hope it will be a little bit um, lighter and not so long the lecture, and we'll have an interesting uh, project for the second half for you to do. And it's also the last lecture, and today we'll talking about not perception of one ear, but of two ears. Why do we actually have two ears? Yes. <laughs> Learning outcomes. What we're trying to understand is the understanding localization, sound localization. This is what it's all about. Where does the sound come from? And its psychological and physiological basis. We're talking about interaural level and time differences. And we're talking about a bit about the physiological basis. Uh, and your practical is to measure your own minimum audible angle in an interesting experiment which will not work particularly well in this room, but it's, 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 it's a good a, a approximation, definitely. Right. Here's some definitions. Listening with two ears. The head, that's the coordinate system. The head is in the middle, two ears. Uh, we've got three planes. <coughs> the horizontal plane, where we can localize. Um, the frontal plane. And the medial plane. What we're interested in is two angles. Every sound source can be described by two angles, namely in one in the horizontal plane and one usually in the, in the median plane. That gives us two angles, namely one in the horizontal plane, so that's what we call the, the horizontal angle, and one above uh, how high it is above the horizon, that's what's called the elevation. These two are completely different uh, how we measure them, and that's why we treat them differently as well. Um, first of all, how do we define localization or how, what do we actually measure to, to work out how, how good we are. We're talking about a minimum audible angle, MAA. That's the smallest detectable change in the direction of a, of a sound source um, that I can tell apart. So if I have a loudspeaker over there and a loudspeaker over there, I can tell that these are two different sound sources and not one. Obviously we're not as good in, as in, in vision in that. But we're quite surprisingly good, and we are about as good as we can be, given the physics of the problem. And if we do that for, we can do that for different angles, like directly in front of us, or slightly to the side of us. And as you imagine, we're best at localizing anything if it is directly in front of us. And if you do measurements of that as pure tones, these are unrealistic stimuli, but they're a good model. Um, and here are results from, what is it, 250 hertz up to 10 kilohertz. And these pure tones have minimum audible angle, MAA, of around 1 to 2 degrees. That's what you should remember. 1 degree is, as, is about as good as you get in the front. And that's pretty damn good if you think about it. If you, if you, if you look at 1 degree, you can easily see the difference, but then the, the wavelength of, of light is 10,000 times faster than the wavelength of sound, but you get one degree, you can actually discriminate, at least in an ideal situation. But um, it, dis it disappears for higher frequencies at about one and a half kilohertz. Um, the, the thresholds go up. And also, interesting is at, at a 30 de uh, degree azimuth, so 30 degrees out there, we are generally much worse, up to 40 degree here for, for one frequency. But the, the reason for that is that we are evolutionary and it just makes sense that we are best at localizing sound in the direction where we're coming from. That's the, the reason why we're looking at a speaker when we talk to somebody, because we, we can ideally concentrate on them. We're looking at them and we're listening to them and our, all of our senses are focused on the direction directly in front of us. Zero degrees, nothing moves. All right. In the horizontal plane, just as a definition, where does the, what, what does the physics do? What do we, how do we can, how can we measure a sound source localization? The measure the sound source comes from the side, here, 30 degrees, that's the nose, that's the two eyes, 
These are the two ears. We have a radius of the head of alpha and a, an angle of theta of the sound source coming from front. And you see that it will reach the, the right ear first and it will travel the distance A times theta to arrive at the left ear in that case. And that will make an interaural time difference. That's what it's called, ITD, interaural time difference of uh, alpha divided by C, that's the speed of, uh, speed of sound, times theta plus sine, uh, sine theta, because you go a little bit around the corner here. Um, that's the, the, the mathematics, uh, straightforward. If, if the sound comes from the front, you have no interaural time difference. If the sound comes from 90 degree, left or right, you've got maximum interaural time difference. And for humans, that maximum time difference, you can calculate that yourself with um, um, A being 9 centimeters for your own head, measure it, you get 670 microseconds. So roughly two-thirds of a millisecond is, that, is, the, is the distance of sound traveling from one ear to the, to the other. And we're good enough to measure that difference. Not only that, imagine that if you have one degree, so we've got a fr front a zero, so at zero we have obviously no interaural time difference, and at one degree, that's our just noticeable dis difference, we've got something like five microseconds difference that we are able to detect. That's pretty good. Okay, that's one. The other one that we can measure is the interaural level difference, because our head is a shadow for the sound from one side. So every time you, you, you have a sound source on one side, then the, the, the head creates a shadow, and the sound will be louder on your ear that is closer to the sound source than on the other side. So here is the, the amplitude of the left ear is louder than the one on the right ear. What you don't see, there's also interaural time difference, but this is so small that you don't see it here, probably. Okay, ILDs and ITDs, as I will call them from now on, they are the both, they are the two, two cues. Here's the interaural time difference again, the ITD. So it arrives at the left ear first and then the right ear, so you've got a phase shift in between. <coughs> Amplitude shift and a phase shift. Okay. Now that tells you everything you need to know uh, about the sound in the horizontal plane. Or, in fact, everywhere. But there is, I should have a picture for that, there is always a confusion because of the ILD and the ITD, you cannot tell the difference of a sound that comes from there, or from there, or from there, or from there, or there, or there, or there. This is a, a, on a cone, it's called the cone of confusion. The ITD and the ILD physically are always the same because they have the same distance to left and right ear and the same level difference as well. So you need to have something else to, to, to re resolve that. One thing that we use is for the, for the vertical plane. So for the vertical plane, I cannot make... Vertical plane means how high is the sound. Is the sound there or there as the same ILD, ITD? Or there or there or behind me? Always the same. I need a, a second cue, a different cue. And that's provided by our pinner. Going back to the very first um, lecture, remember what this thing is for. It filters sound. It has a transfer function. And here is the transfer function for two uh, sound directions, directly from above and directly from the front. And you see that because of the shape of the pinner, of the notches in there and the concha there, um, sound will be somewhere spread into it until it gets into the um, ear canal. And that all provides a filter that pr filters something between 0 and 50 decibel or maybe even 20 decibel in specific frequencies. So knowing that filter shape, and knowing the sound, uh, the, the, the frequency content of the sound source, you'll be able to calculate where, what the height of the actual sound source was. Okay, these are some uh, cues for localization to show you that they're individually different. Um, not much, but they are. These are two different um, people measure the, the interaural time difference as a function of the angle and you see that this is a fairly straightforward line because at, 100, at 0 degree it's 0 and at 180 degrees 0 so just in front and just behind you there is no interaural time difference and in between it goes up pretty linearly up to 90 degrees and then it goes down again 
And they are slightly different for each person because of the size of the head and the, uh, the shape of the head. Um, the interaural level differences as a function of frequency are also quite different. This is only for one person. But you see that, the, that these, these, these um, transfer functions vary dramatically as a function of frequency and as a function of, of, of the angle. So a, good, a better plot to do that is a three-dimensional plot. And if you combine all of this information, you get something which is called the head-related transfer function. Okay, I'll show you that in the next slide. Just to, 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 to reiterate, was a guy called Rayleigh has actually developed that theory already at the beginning of the 20th century. Um, and just to summarize that, and to make it clearer, we, we use these two uh, strategies, the ILDs, the level differences, and the temporal differences, the time differences. But we use the differences in level more at the higher frequencies. Uh, and that is because differences with an, an, um, l well, higher frequency sounds have a bigger difference in level around our head because they get attenuated more. A 10 kilohertz sound gets attenuated a lot by traveling around my head, whereas a 50 hertz sound with a wavelength of 3 meters doesn't get attenuated at all. Because if the wavelength is more than four times the size of my head, my head isn't an obstacle, general acoustics. And so this, this is approximately 2 kilohertz. That's where the, the, the size of the head is about a quarter of the wavelength. And there, ILDs become uh, irrelevant to lower frequencies. The other way around it is for uh, time differences. They work best at low frequencies because our neurons are not fast enough otherwise. Because we, we talk a lot about neural processing um, and we know that the neurons can only code certain frequencies at certain, they're only as fast. At about 2 kilohertz, they actually are not fast enough anymore to notice the difference between the face on the left and on the right ear. So this is why, if I go back to the, to the initial uh, function here, there is actually a, a, a gap at, at, at between 100 and 1000 hertz. This is the temporal coding. This is where we work very well because we measure the temporal difference between the two ears. And above is where we measure the, the level differences. And they are inherently not as precise as the temporal codes. Okay, so I said localization cues are different because our ears are different. Um, the ultimate goal of, of loudspeakers, I say, <laughs> being in the ISVR, the acoustics department, that here's all about good representation of sound, or a lot of people here working on that. And typically people use loudspeakers to do that, but they are, as you might know, far from ideal because a loudspeaker representation you never get a feeling as if you are actually in an acoustic environment. The reason for that is that the loudspeakers have crosstalk. You cannot, if you have a loudspeaker there and a loudspeaker there, both of these speakers talk to both of my ears, directly and indirectly. So I cannot control which faces I have on the left and on the right ear from both loudspeakers. Um, People wanted to work on that. So you can never, if you have two loudspeakers, that's your experience, if you have two loudspeakers, put them together, you will never hear a sound outside of the scope of the two loudspeakers. You will not be able to produce a sound that you perceive behind you, or above you, or left or right. That's just the physics. The physics is because the, 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 the frequencies interact in face on both ears, they cancel each other out. So what, what people came up with with that is what's called this 3D virtual sound field. That's what, what, what's the aim. If you want to reproduce a sound field, you want to put somebody acoustically in a situation where it hears, it, it, they hear what the person hears in that situation. So you need to reconstruct the sound fields at both ears that are exactly right, in amplitude and in level, and in time, obviously, in phase. When I say phase, this is interchangeable with time. Okay, the, the, the phase of a, of a pure tone is always how, how far they are apart in time from each other. Right, with headphones, on the other hand, you can do that. You can generate a sound field in a headphone where you can control the left ear input and the right ear input exactly 
so that you will get a reconstruction that can be any kind of, of, of sound field. And if you all have heard demonstrations, certainly via headphones, where you hear a sound that is coming behind you or in front of you or above you or wherever. If, you not, if you're not careful with the, with the sound field generation, standard headphones that are very flat in frequency and, 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 and just having, I don't know, standard music, everybody knows that, you, that the perception of the sound is virtually always within your head. Is that right? If you think about where you hear a sound, if you listen to headphones, it is normally inside your head. That's because normal recordings do not take care of, the, of your head-related transfer functions. They do not correct for the filtering that your own ear introduces. Now, interesting it would be, obviously, to do that, to, to measure your head-related transfer function, to introduce that into the recordings, and to be able to hear sounds outside of your head. That's what we're going to do in this experiment later on. Um, but this is, there's a lot of technology going into that. And I have always had the prediction that in 10 years' time you can go into Tesco, measure your own head-related transfer function, put them, build them into your MP3 player, whatever, and have an actual virtual sound field representation. The mathematics is not very difficult. The, the, the calculations are um, long, but with nowadays computer technology you can do that in real time. The measurements are not too difficult because you can do it by sticking a little microphone into your ear. That's a tiny microphone, it doesn't hurt. Uh, it's playing some sounds and it's not very difficult. But then I did this prediction 10 years ago and nothing had happened so far, so maybe, maybe somebody proves me wrong in the next 10 years. I would think it is an interesting project, though. The other thing that you can do, by the way, and which is done in the ISVR to create these virtual sound fields, uh, which you can do with modern technology or modern te computer technology, you can actually calculate where the person is in a sound field and then change all the faces of all the, the loudspeakers in front of you so that they will co correct automatically for the faces to generate a sound field which is virtually everywhere around you. That is, that is technology that you can buy in Japan <laughs> or via the internet, but for, for some reason not in the UK. And um, somebody from the ISVR developed that, and my, my prediction is in a few years' time that will be built in into every computer monitor. You only need a few small loudspeakers in front of you, which are very close to each other, close to each other because you want to you want to make use of the interference between them. And they only work if you're sitting in a sweet spot just in front of them. If you go to the side, they don't work anymore. But if you are in a sweet spot, then they can recreate the sound field at your ears with the same with the right level differences and the right uh, face differences between your two ears. So then you hear something behind you coming out of a computer. Obviously, lots of application for games and, well, all sorts of virtual reality. Yes, but what do we need to do? What do we need to know about that? Is your head-related transfer functions. That's what I'm talking about. That's why, what, what, why I introduced that. And this is how we measure them. Well, in, in, in the lab, this guy is called Kima because it's a, it's a company name and they produce virtually all of them for the whole world. Um, and it has plastic ears, one left and one right. They have pre pretty much exactly the same consistency as our own ears. And I've got two different types, namely small ones and large ones, small ones for women, large ones for men. But you see the problem already, because they are average ears, but they're not exactly your own ear, because all ears are individual. But you get a reasonably good fit if you do an average ear. This here is the big ones for the men. There are two microphones built in, um, cables coming out. And what you do now is you have all of these, these are the different angles, and you measure every individual angle that is possible in horizontal and in, 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 in um, azimuth. And you measure the transfer function from the sound source to the two microphones inside the ear. You need the head and you need the, the shoulder specifically because they all have an impact on the individual sound frequencies or on the transfer functions because low frequencies get reflected from the shoulders into the ears. That makes a difference. You can actually hear that. Um, yeah, uh, practical, useful because you can do it quickly in the laboratory but they're not individually um, perfect. And you'll hear that. The, the experiment that we'll do is, is, is measured with this schema guy. 
Um, and depending if your ears are similar to the original chemo, you get better results as if you're not similar. <coughs> and what you get with these are these HRTFs, head-related transfer functions of the horizontal and median plane. That's the horizontal, that's the median. And see, these are now a lot more complicated because we need three parameters for that. We need the frequencies, so there's a transfer function in frequency for each degree angle. So you've got one at zero, one at 10, 20, 30, 40, and so on. Um, but that's only in the horizontal plane. You also get them in the median plane. So in fact, you get them, you get an infinite number of them you need if you wanted to recreate every sound source everywhere. Um, so this is where, where it's computationally difficult. But you actually only need a big memory. You don't need big computations because the computation is only a convolution that you, that you do between them. Okay, here what we have is the, the, the median plane, below, front, above, back, below, and the difference, um, that this is how much dB there actually differs as a function of the frequency. And you see all of these notches and the mountains in here, that's all a function of your own pinner. Okay, just a little background on the physiology of that. I, I, I do that because this is probably the best understood neural system um, that we know of. We, we actually know what the neurons are doing, where the neurons sit, uh, and, and, and how they're doing that, and it's quite uh, interesting or in, in, in important um, aspect for survival, certainly in, in, in real world with the owl and the, the, the mouse. The mouse must know where the owl is coming from, even when it's not looking at it, especially in the dark. And what the mouse can do is measure the ITD, the interaural time difference, between the two ears. Now, a mouse head is only about half a centimeter wide, so their maximum ITDs are much, much smaller than ours but they are much more specialized on that than us, so they're much better at localis localizing a sound because it's evolutionary, it's um, for immense survival value for them. But nevertheless, for us, it's evolutionary also very important to be very good at that. Okay, so what do neurons do? We know that we have, this is a representation of, of, of a mouse brain. We've got the two cochlea, one on the left and one on the right, and we need to connect them somehow. And it, don't worry about the specific names here, but what we know is that there's an auditory nerve going in. It's connected to a brain station here, going, this is what's called ipsilateral, and going to the contralateral side, so to the other side, and they are connected here in a thing called NFO, <coughs> the superior olive, but both ears, the neurons, connect all to neurons in the MSO, in this place. So they have a connection to the left and to the right. So that's known from anatomy, and this is beautiful because we can make a theory, or people have made a theory how it works, which is built on um, neural coincidence detectors on delay lines. And the, the, the basic behind that is that neurons are not infinitely fast, but the, neuro, the, the, the transduction is about a meter a second. So in the grand scheme of things, not very fast at all. Um, and if it comes from the left ear, like in, the, in here, if the sound comes from the front, if you, if you want, uh, then it will take a little bit longer to travel this distance than it will travel to this distance. And uh, we've got a little video here to demonstrate how that works. This guy called Jeffries has made that in the, in, in the 1940s. What you see is first a model of the, of the brainstem, very schematic. You've got the two cochlea, the left ear and the right ear. You've got the auditory nerve, auditory nerve, and this is what this, the superior olive, don't worry about that, but we know that it consists of, of neurons, in this case here, exemplary seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and we now see a sound coming from the front, very fast, and that will be then uh, played in slow motion. And these things here are spikes that travel down the, 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 the neural pathways. So now in slow motion, the sound comes in, Spikes will come from both sides at the same time because the sound comes from the front. But this one travels faster than that one, or this one travels a longer path. And so only neuron number two gets the input from the left and the right at the same time. So if you imagine that neuron, that these neurons are little and um, optic, um, logical operators, they need an input, two inputs at the same time. That's what's called coincidence detection. 
And if they get two inputs at the same time, they will pause. <coughs> now, what happens if the sound comes from different direction? Here from the left side. This one comes first. This one comes next. So this one has a little bit of, a, of headway. And you see that now, instead of number two, number six is active. And that's all that you need to know um, in, in this model. This is the model again. You've got the sound from the front and from the side. And you have the left ear and the right ear input. And this one travels and this one travels and they meet here in the middle. And if the sound comes a little bit from the side, this one travels first and they meet a little bit to this side. So what you, what you have here is a, a representation of the physical environment, maybe where sound comes from, which is represented now in the physical picture of the outside world in your brain. And this is a tonotopic relationship or a, um, well, a, a relationship. So where something is in the outside world is now where is the inside in your brain. So what you can imagine is that your brain has now the ability to tell where a sound source is because it just has to look if, if this neuron is active or if that, that neuron is active or if that neuron is active, sound comes from over there. So this is how the brain does these things. It always looks at there's a group of neurons which is active. That means there must be something there. And now we have an exact tonotopic representation. So there's a neighboring relationship and everything. So that the outside world is like on the retina. The retina has a picture of the outside world. And acoustically, you also have a picture of the outside world, uh, which is nicely ordered in a, in, a, in a tonotopic fashion. This is an excellent example for how we understand or how we began to understand how the neural or how the brain, the human brain, actually works. Because it's the first time that people have the idea that time plays an absolutely important role. Before that, it was just believed that neurons act as little amplifiers or the cables um, that, that are like electrical cables that you plug together. But it is far from it. What is actually most important is the exact timing properties of things. So you see that if you, if only a few microseconds between uh, discriminate this neuron from that neuron. It, it, they, they do exactly the same thing apart from in the time domain. And they're very, very precise. There have been neurons have been found, not in human, but in other animals, that can discriminate um, times on the basis of nanoseconds. So a few nanoseconds. That's 10 to the power of minus 9 seconds. That's how precise they actually look at the outside world. So the auditory system is by far the most, the, the fastest <coughs> system in the, in the brain, uh, the, the, the one with the highest precision in ter time, ter terms of temporal aspects. And this model is how we learned about that and how people were inspired by that. That's why I show it to you. It also illustrates nicely that ITDs have a real um, presence. Okay, in the exercise, um, I want you to ask, to, I ask you to measure your own minimum audible angle, um, which is the average. We're not doing that for, 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 for specific um, degrees, but we're doing it as an average of all sounds from minus 90 to plus 90 degrees. And uh, what's, what's happening is, is, I give you a worksheet, it's all explained there, a little program, a MATLAB program. I hope all of you had some experience with MATLAB, but you don't need very much apart from starting it and typing in space, S-P-A-C-E. The rest is done automatic. I'm sure you'll be fine with that. Um, and then what you, what you get is a headphone experiment. Uh, you get a little picture on the screen where there's a, um, you get a sound presented, which is recorded through the head-related transfer function of a chemo. And if your ears are similar to the one of the chemo, you will hear that sound externalized. That's what the, the technical term is. That means internal means you, you hear it within your head. That's what you do when you're listening to radio on the, on the headphones. But if you listen to these sounds, you should hear them actually coming from outside of your head, from a direction somewhere outside. And the sound is a, is a ringtone, a telephone ringtone. Um, and your task is just to find out or to click on a 180-degree um, um, picture where you think the sound comes from. 
And then we do a little bit of analysis to find out how big the difference was. So basically we calculate how big the difference was between the presentation and, the, um, and your response. And the average that to get your minimum audible angle. Okay.